Hello, and welcome to the Mechanochemistry Discussions. This seminar series is hosted by the Center for Mechanical Control of Chemistry, or the CMCC. The goal of the seminar series is to bring the community together. Our seminars stream live on the third Thursday of every month at 10 a.m. Central. They're hosted live on YouTube and also made available there on our YouTube channel to watch anytime. Please do check out our previous speakers. There are quite a few excellent presentations available again on the YouTube channel. We also have um, quite an excellent slate of speakers upcoming, so we encourage you to join us for all of the future presentations as part of the seminar series. Before we get started with today's seminar, a great big thanks to Dr. James Batiste, the Center Director, Jennifer Belsick, the Center Administrative Coordinator, and two CMCC students who host the seminar series, Quintarius Moore and Noah Sheehan. Thank you so much for joining us ahead of time. Please do subscribe to the YouTube channel, CMCC Mechanochemistry Discussions. Also, a note that this seminar is being recorded. If you have questions during the seminar, please do uh, communicate them to us. You can email them to us at the Gmail account shown here, CMCC Discussions at Gmail. You can post them on YouTube as well, but please note that we do reserve the right to, right to remove comments or questions from YouTube. Lastly and finally, welcome to today's speaker, Dr. Stuart James. Dr. James is a professor of inorganic chemistry at Queen's University, Belfast. He has researched mechanochemistry since 2003, making microporous metal organic framework ma materials by ball, mi ball milling for the first time. His studies in mechanochemistry have broadened to include fundamental work, as well as scale-up and commercialization through the spin-out company Moth Technologies, who manufactured the first commercial moth material using twin screw extrusion as a continuous solvent-free process. He has also invented porous liquids, proposing them as a novel concept in 2007, leading the team that demonstrated them in 2015, and now commercializing them through the spin-out company Porous Liquid Technologies Limited, Please join me in welcoming Dr. Stuart James to the Mechanochemistry Discussions. Hello, uh, thank you very much for the introduction. And I'm delighted to, uh, to be invited to speak in, in this uh, very interesting series. Uh, so I'm gonna tell you a bit about our work on mechanochemistry and essentially try to tell some sort of story that goes all the way from the sort of fundamental questions that we've tried to answer all the way up to scale up and eventually commercialization. Um, just as a bit of background, you know, I'm a chemist and what we do in my group is make materials um, and we uh, either we try to do something innovative in the terms of the way that we make them and so that's where mechanochemistry comes in or we try to make innovative actually types of materials, which is where the porous liquids come in. Uh, but obviously today I'm going to concentrate on mechanochemistry. So um, mechanochemical synthesis. Um, this started for us uh, actually when I went to a conference, I think back in 2003, and I heard a, a talk by Gerd Kalp, who many people will remember. And, uh, and he said uh, something which I found astounding. He said, actually, you don't need solvents to do chemistry. You can just grind solids together. And I thought this was fascinating. And at that time, we were working with materials called MOFs, metal organic frameworks. And I'll talk a little bit about those later. By the way, I will try not to talk too much chemistry because I know that there's a non-specialist audience. Um, but these materials were very solvent dependent. If you made them in one solvent, you got one structure. If you made them in a different solvent, you got a different structure. And so the question was, well, what happens if you don't use any solvent at all? And that was the initial question that we, we tried to answer. So we bought one of these things called a ball mill. Uh, which many of you will be familiar with. It's basically you have a steel jar and you put into that your reactants. And I'm going to see if I can get the laser pointer going. Uh, you put into that your reactants and you have a ball bearing and, and basically the machine just sort of shakes it from side to side. And we were astounded to find that reactions that were reported in the literature to take you know, a couple of days 
we could do in five minutes in the ball mill. And it was quite amazing. I have to say, we had no track record in doing this type of chemistry at all. And we sort of sat on these results for quite a long time because we didn't really know how to talk about them, how to, ex how to explain them. But that was basically the, the beginning. Um, and you know, over that time, I've become more and more convinced that you know, mechanochemistry has a very big role to play in synthesis going forward. And I mean, all the way up to industrial scales as well. Uh, it's a fascinating area because, uh, you know, we don't, we still don't really understand a lot about the fundamentals, but also, of course, now is the perfect time to be really rethinking the processes that everybody uses and takes for granted, which are simply not sustainable. You know, the amount of solvents that we use is simply cannot go on. By way of the sort of history um, of mechanochemistry, many people go back to the ancient Greeks and these uh, quotes uh, uh, of Aristotle, sometimes, uh, sometimes translated as no reactions in the absence of a solvent. What did he mean by a reaction? Probably not what we think of today is in terms of a chemical reaction. Another, another um, uh, translation is that liquids are the most, are the type of substance most likely to mix. Now that's a lot less contentious, yeah? But this is, I think this is at the heart of mechanochemistry. What we find is that as long as you can get solids to mix properly, that's where the ball milling comes in or the extrusion, then you can actually get quantitative reactions together. Uh, but I think it has to be said that in chemical synthesis, uh, people tend to use solvents just without thinking about it. And to be honest, this is still the way that we teach chemical synthesis in the labs and all the rest of it. So that when it comes to, you know, uh, to, to think of how you're going to do some synthesis, the first question, or one of the first questions, is normally, so which solvent are we going to use to do it in? Not the question, do we actually need a solvent to do this? Yeah? And I think that's the sort of change in mindset that is starting to happen and is going to continue, uh, and I think it is going to lead to uh, more sustainable chemistry. So a few years ago, and I tried to sit down and think, you know, where are we going with mechanochemistry? A few different projects going, and I tried to sort of summarise it into a few questions. Um, how do these reactions proceed? First of all, at the microscopic level, so at the level of sort of particles of solids, um, and then even at the molecular level, can we get a picture for what's going on there? Because I found it you know, very difficult to visualize what was actually happening here. And then secondly, how can we make this chemistry relevant? We can talk about green chemistry and saving the planet, but if, if we only ever work with ball mills doing, you know, a gram at a time or something like that, it's never going to change the world. So where is the actual impact for this going to come? And towards the end, then I'll talk about synthesis by twin screw extrusion and, uh, and our efforts to commercialize that. So first of all, at the microscopic level, what are we talking about here? This is, if you like, at the level of particles of powder. You know, uh, can we picture what's going on there? And a good way to, you know, get some insight into things that are too small for you to see in chemistry, so about molecules or particles, is to study the reaction kinetics. What's the rate of the reaction in various different conditions? And here we have an example of what I would say is really some surprisingly simple kinetics. So kinetics is sort of rate of reaction. It can be affected by all kinds of things. And when we do ball milling reactions, for example, the temperature changes, for one thing, because you get friction. And if the temperature changes, then you expect the rate of reaction to change. And also, if we're turning reactants into products, then the mechanical properties of the medium will change, and that might affect things. So to be honest, when we started doing these kinetic studies, we expected that the, the results were going to be way too complicated to interpret. What we actually found, as I'll show you, is some surprisingly simple results. So. Um, Perhaps I have to get rid of this uh, laser pointer to start this with. Let me start with just a really simple observation. Um, this is taking two solid reactants. Now, remember to try to put yourself in the mindset of a chemist who always wants to dissolve things in solvents to get them to react. If we just put these two reactants, they're both white. One happens to be a zinc salt, and the other one is an organic molecule that combined to it. And you just mix them together in uh, a sample vial and you can just shape that sample vial with your hand or in this case you stir it with a spatula and even within a few seconds you can actually get a chemical reaction to happen and you can see that by changing color not dramatic but it is there changing color from white to, to yellow 
Um, so that looks, you know, at first sight, that's a chemical reaction, it's chemical synthesis, and it's unbelievably simple to do. But when you look at this reaction mixture and you analyze it, it's barely any product formation at all. It's virtually all starting materials still. The reason it changes color is because those reactions are just happening on the surfaces of the particles, and that's what you see with your eye. So essentially, what a ball mill does is it just makes that process happen many, 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 many times. So the ball comes along and it crashes the materials and basically breaks them apart, exposes fresh surfaces and stirs the whole lot together until the reaction has actually proceeded right throughout your reaction mixture. So what do we see in terms of reaction kinetics? This is a, another reaction involves zinc and an organic, and you don't really need to worry about what that chemistry is, but maybe just note that there's also a byproduct here, which is water, and you might think, well, that will have an effect as well, and this is gonna be very complicated. Now, so I won't go into how, you know, how we did all these measurements, but the upshot is that the, the reaction kinetics were extremely simple. It was just what we call second order, and I'll try and explain that in a moment. But basically, you plot the data, you plot the graphs, and you get very straight lines indicating this second order behavior. It doesn't agree quite so much when we mill at, at, at higher speeds, but still, it's closer to second order than, than anything else. So what does that mean? It means that the rate of the reaction, the speed the reaction goes, is basically a constant times the amount of zinc oxide and the amount of the organic, okay? And I put them as concentrations, which is a bit naughty. You probably shouldn't do that in this case, but it doesn't matter. That'll, that, that'll do for this. Um, so it's actually extremely simple. And there are many, many, you know, well, countless examples of chemical reactions that go via these sorts of kinetics. So we're not seeing any of those complications that we expected. Um, and essentially, it's analogous to what we would say in a gas state or in solution, that molecule meets molecule, and that's what determines the rate. It's the rate of reactive collisions between molecules. Molecules are always tumbling around, they bump into each other. The rate at which they bump into each other and have a reactive collision, that is what is determining the overall rate of the reaction. But this is essentially consistent with what I was just saying in this case, that the milling is just promoting these particle to particle contacts and collisions, as simple as that. Bear in mind also, I haven't got time to go into all of this, but there is a lot written about the strange effects that you can get with mechanochemistry um, and the sort of physical breaking of bonds some, uh, and hotspots. And that may well be true in many cases, but in these sorts of cases, you don't actually need any of those complicated you know, interpretations to explain what's going on. Now, in this example that I gave, basically, if you mill more quickly, you, know, you go from 10 hertz to 25 hertz, then the reaction goes more quickly. And that's, that's exactly what you'd expect because you're increasing the rate at which your particles of powder are bumping into each other. But something which was really puzzling at first was that, as I mentioned, the temperature in these ball mills increases as you mill for a certain amount of time. So and excuse excuse me really um, quickly, Stuart. I think I, occasionally your hands are covering your microphone, so you're getting a little oh, soft okay. intermittently, but otherwise you'd be good. Okay, Grant, thanks. Mm -hmm. uh, so the um, so the the jars heat up as you uh, grind, yeah? And so they might go from room temperature up to about 60 degrees. And um, what you would expect, as a, normally with chemical reactions, if you heat them up, they go more quickly. Uh, the rule of thumb is that every 10 degrees that you increase the temperature, the reaction rate doubles. So as we're doing our milling re reactions, we expect the temperature, well, if the temperature does increase, we expect the rate to increase as well. But remember, what we see here is basically these simply straight lines. We're not seeing any systematic increase in the rate of reaction as we go, as we, you know, as we go through the reaction. And at first, this was really puzzling because this is kind of one of the things about, you know, um, you know, chemical kinetics. Temperature pretty much always increases the rate of reaction. But actually, we go back to our model that we developed for this. That it's not about why does why does temperature increase the rate of reaction largely because molecules tumble more quickly 
when they are heated up. And so they collide more quickly. And so reactions happen more quickly. In this case, it's not about molecules. It's about bits of powder, particles of powder. And they don't move around more quickly if you heat them up. So temperature, actually, in this case, it makes perfect sense that the temperature increases, but the rate of reaction doesn't increase because it's about particles of powder having to bump into each other. And that all depends on the rate at which you're milling. So some surprises in this, uh, but I, I suppose one of the points I'm making here is that a lot of this stuff was really fundamentally just not understood. And we develop, and I think the, the development of kinetic models is really important to understand what's going on. Now, I gave an example of a really simple uh, reaction there. Uh, let me give you an example of something that's a bit more complicated. Uh, this had a scratch in our heads as well. Uh, this is an organic reaction. It doesn't really matter what it is, um, but uh, it's, it's called a, a Novanagel condensation. And it's another one that, you know, you link two organic molecules together and then it's water. And in, <clears throat> excuse me, in, in, the, in blue here, is what happens to the reaction in solution. So you have conversion up here in terms of percent. So we're going from zero up to somewhere near 100 as the reaction progresses. And this is time along here. And it kind of behaves itself. This is classic stuff that you see in solution. No, no big surprise there. In the ball mill, what was really surprising is that we see this sort of sigmoidal conversion. So this is very different to the example that we just looked at that was very straightforward. There's something extra going on here. And sigmoidal conversion suggests that for some reason the reaction is slow and then it speeds up and then it slows down again. And there are many examples of this in chemistry, but they're, they're kind of complicated in that, that it can be autocatalysis, for example. So you make a product that catalyzes the reaction, that accelerates the reaction. These sorts of things can happen. And not going into all the details of you know, how we work this out, but eventually, what we, um, what we were able to discount the fact that there was autocatalysis. We were also able to discount the fact that there was, a, there was an initiation stage where the particle size was increasing up down to a critical value and then the reaction took off. We managed to discount that. We managed to discount that there was an exotherm, that the reaction was heating itself up, basically. What it came down to, as far as we can tell, is that uh, and, and, and we still don't fully understand this, is that there was a strange observation because when you're doing kinetics and you're sort of opening the jar to look at these reactions, what we see is that it starts as a powder and it ends as a powder. But in the middle, something very, very bizarre happens. Um, we get something that looks like sort of rubber and it actually just coats the ball bearing. Uh, and it's a bizarre thing. We've seen it, you know, a few times and other people have seen this thing as well. But that intermediate stage, and we don't really know why it forms, what are the conditions for this thing to form, but that seems to correspond to the state at which the reaction is, uh, is fastest. Whether it's a subtle thermal effect uh, of this, you know, change in the rheology, uh, or whether effectively it's a sort of change in concentration, because now all of your um, reactants are... Uh, uh, sort of mashed together into one place we don't quite know but I think the interesting thing about this the sort of the overall lesson is that we've got a combination of chemistry and mechanics here um, chemistry is affecting rheology so as the reaction goes and the rheology seems to then affect the chemistry in terms of the reaction rate and I guess the clue is in the title. This is mechanochemistry. We need to bring, you know, knowledge and understanding from different areas. Chemists wouldn't normally consider these aspects of rheology and mechanics, yeah? Uh, but I think we need to if we're going to understand this stuff. And just to point out, actually, uh, this is uh, from Elena Boldareva. Elena and her father, of course, you know, luminaries in the whole area chemistry. Um, just to point out that Elena has, uh, you know, using these transparent jars, has shown that you get this, the same sort of thing happening. This is a different chemical reaction, uh, but uh, she calls it this snowball, uh, the snowball effect. And I think it's a very nice name, actually, because if anything, that in our case, that's where the reaction was increasing in rates. So it's almost like there is a snowball effect to the, to the reaction. But again, this interplay between chemistry and mechanics. So I do think these kinetic models are really important. Um, and to point out that even though, you know, there are obviously a lot of classical solid state reaction models out there, 
Avrami, etc. Um, alone, they do not seem to explain some of the phenomena that we're seeing even in simple creations. And, and that's a whole area which I think is wide open to, to be sorted out now. Kind of what are the rules of magic sorting out? And what are the models? Stop wearing my hands around. Um, coming back to our current questions in mechanochemical synthesis, how do they proceed? We've, we've sort of covered the microscopic level. What about the molecular level? We'd love to be able to see what's actually happening to the molecules themselves as, as we go through this process. Now, it's very difficult to image these, uh, these molecules using microscopy, etc. So we resorted to molecular modeling, and I would say, I think, to basically just doing these things in a computer. And the um, uh, uh, this is obviously in collaboration with other people. I, I couldn't do this, but this was in discussion with Mario Del Popolo and others. Uh, and Michael Ferguson um, is, uh, was, the, was the lead student on this who managed to get this thing to work. Um, and as far as we know, we knew uh, you know, this had not been done before, where you tried to picture what was happening in a mechanochemical reaction at the molecular level. Uh, and the one that we took, uh, again, it doesn't really matter exactly what it is, but it happens to be a co-crystallization that involves aspirin. Basically, red molecules, blue molecules. So here's your crystal of red molecules. Here's your crystal of blue ones. They're both, but, you know, regular repeating lattices. And what was known, this was worked by Mike Zawarotka, was that if you milled these two together, then you get what's called a co-crystal, where now the molecules alternate in the solid state. So for various reasons, we chose to look at this one. And um, as I say, we would like really to be able to picture what's going on at the molecular level. So let me just show you uh, a movie of one of these simulations. So this is all done in the computer. And what's going to happen is that part of a blue crystal is going to be pushed into part of this red crystal. And see what happens. So you can see the regular repeating pattern within these fragments here. So as they're pushed together, you see this sort of compression, the squashing of the crystals. And then as they're pulled apart, what you can see is that there is a sort of a connective neck of molecules there uh, as these things are pulled apart. And finally, they're pulled apart to the point where that neck uh, snaps. And what you can see is that some blue molecules have ended up down here and some red molecules have ended up there. So, this is potentially you know, the, the sort of, some sort of image, some sort of window into what's happening in the early stages of a mechanochemical reaction. Just purely intuitively, I mean, there are various things that we can quantify in here, but I'm not going to go into all that. But just intuitively, what I think is surprising about this is that most chemists think of a crystal as being something which is fairly, um, you know, it's rigid and... Um, uh, and it has this regular structure. But what these models are suggesting is that under collisions, that's not true. That if anything, they're behaving more like putty or something like that. And then we can perhaps start to understand how this mixing is occurring. And then, you know, it's, it's beyond the, the time scale of simulations to get all the way to showing how the co-crystal forms, but we can start to see what the beginning of that process is. Okay, so that's some sort of fundamental uh, questions around mechanochemistry. How do we eventually make a difference? Uh, how do we get from small ball mill scale reactions up to something that's actually industrially applicable? We tried bigger ball mills uh, and we ran into problems. So I don't know if other people have done this, um, but you know, with a small ball mill, you can get all sorts of different things together. As you go to larger ones, so this is a planetary ball mill, you can do about 300 grams at a time here. This is an attrito, which will do one to five kilos, and you can get up to tumbler mills that even do tons, potentially. Uh, these mills are obviously not normally used for chemistry, they're used for grinding up material, etc. So you try to do some chemistry in these things, and what happens, pretty soon you run into problems. Well, that's, that's our experience. Um, and so, for example, what often happens is that your reactants basically just cake together. And instead of getting a chemical reaction to happen, you just get a solid rock hard mixture of your two reactants. 
So this is a competing process that can happen by milling. Milling can break material down and mix it up, but it can also end up basically just compacting materials. And that in our hands was the sort of thing that would tend to happen as we go to these sorts of scales. My interpretation of that is that if, even though obviously, you know, these, these machines are putting in huge amounts of energy, the amount of energy per gram of your chemical reactants is going down at every step. So this is actually a really violent machine. It's a small machine, but you know, really huge amounts of energy per gram going in. And that's what keeps it moving around and stops it from just compacting. But as you go up, actually these machines are getting gentler and gentler and what they're doing is really just sort of squashing the materials together. So basically, I'd, I, I'm sure you know, large scale ball milling will work in some cases, but I don't think at the moment it doesn't look like the best solution to me. Um, what we settled on was twin screw extrusion. Uh, so a colleague of mine, Tony McNally in mechanical engineering in Queens. Um, so there we are collaborating with a, a mechanical engineer. Um, I went to him and said, you know, we're doing these ball milling reactions, you know, surely there's another solution to this. And he said, well, we have a processing hall full of twin screw extruders. And I didn't know what he meant by that, but we certainly, you know, we became familiar with them fairly quickly. So, uh, and I have to say, actually, this also builds on work uh, of forming um, co-crystals by uh, solvent-free twin screw extrusion done by workers in Amgen, but also at the University of Bradford in the UK, so around about the same time. So a twin screw extruder, what is this? So I'll show you a movie in a moment, but essentially you have two screws and they're housed in a barrel and these screws will convey material along them, but also then the, the shape, the profile of the screw changes and it mashes together the, 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 the material you have there. So they can be used for processing of polymers. You can mix polymers with other you know, fillers, composite formulation. You can form pellets. Uh, people make pasta and pizza dough. And another thing about this is that the scaling is relatively well understood. And so that's another thing with ball milling is that, you know, the, the models for how you go from small to big ones isn't well understood. It's much better understood with extrusion. So um, here we go. This is, uh, this is a movie of a small extruder, which we have in a fume cupboard. And uh, the, the top is off the barrel. So you can, see, you can see perhaps the two screws there rotating next to each other. And imagine that how material will be conveyed along them. And if I just stop it and just go back again, you'll see certain points along the screws, the geometry changes. And these are the mixing zones where it really forces whatever you've got in there to mix together. Um, so not conventionally used for chemistry, but here's an example of one actually doing a reaction. It's a bit of an old video. Excuse me if you can hear the squeaks and things here. But this is... Uh, um, uh, just in this case, just a, a hand mix, uh, a, a, a hand mixed mixture of reagents. Again, it's that Novonagel reaction, and this will go yellow. As imagine the materials being conveyed down the barrel there, and they come out the end. And there is actually a quantitative conversion, a quantitative chemical reaction, so effectively 100% from starter materials to products, and that all happens in the space of a couple of minutes. So about a two minute residence time in here, no solvent involved. And kind of as a chemist, you have to pinch yourself sometimes. Think, Does this really actually work? Um, we, it's almost like a magic wand, this thing, that you kind of, you've got a bottle of A and a bottle of B and solids, and you somehow, within a couple of minutes, you've got product C and you haven't used any solvent. There is a byproduct here, which is water, uh, but the water is actually just, um, boiled off basically because the barrel is heated to 150 degrees. So that's an example. I think it sort of illustrates the, the, the power of this approach. Uh, and I do think that there is enormous potential for this in industry. Um, it's continuous. Many engineers like continuous processes. It's solvent free. Um, the space time yields. This is a, like a, just a, a, an idea of how you know, efficient the reaction is. The, these can be up to a thousand times greater than for um, conventional solvent-based reactions. You can control the temperature, the feed rate, the speed at which the screws rotate. You can potentially control the atmosphere, the screw profile as well. This is modular, so you can design screws for a particular reaction. You can add in reagents along the barrel if you want to. You can even do in-situ monitoring. 
all of this is actually already there uh, with with extrusion. And so I think there are actually many advantages over ball milling for that for those reasons as well. There's another movie which I could show you. It's a little bit flashier and it's a bit more up to date, but I th I think you basically get the idea uh, that you know it's it's quite amazing really it, how how this thing works. Just to mention the modular screw configuration. So um, obviously there there is some uh, there is some engineering here in terms of the conveying regions that you have, then you have kneading regions, and then you all, you tend to alternate the conveying and kneading ones. Um, here, here's a quite a nice trick as well. This is quite counterintuitive that you can actually reverse the uh, the sense of the screws, and, and and what that should do in principle is it should actually reverse the flow of your reactants as they're going down. In reality, what it does it doesn't reverse it, but it does slow it slow it down. And if you have one of these reverse conveying sections here, then, uh, and if you place that just after, so that's the reverse conveying section there. If you place that just after one of these mixing or kneading zones, then that can be very effective to get reactions to go. So essentially there are some, uh, there are some intuitive ways that you can design these screws to, to make reactions go. Um, so one of the early things that we did was to make these materials called MOFs. Uh, these are metal organic frameworks. I won't bother to go into the history of this, but you know, very exciting class of materials developed a lot over recent years. One of the problems was always, you know, how do you make large amounts of these? Uh, and if you can do that without using any solvents, then you know it's absolutely fantastic. Um, and so we found actually, uh, you know, that many of these classic MOF materials uh, could be made by extrusion. Uh, there's an example of a bag being, you know, being filled with the stuff there. And um, we started a company. Do I talk about that here? Perhaps I'll talk about that a little bit later. But again, just to emphasize the the space time yields. So, so this is this is. This is a, sometimes engineers use this parameter. It's basically the amount of material you, that you make uh, kilograms per meter cubed of your reactor volume per day. And it gives you an idea of how sort of intense and how efficient your process is. And you'll see our figures in red here are orders of magnitude greater than the figures for the normal solvent-based uh, synthesis. And that's because you don't, you know, typically in a solvent-based reaction, the solvent is, is most of what you have. It may be there in a hundredfold excess compared to your reagents, yeah? You get rid of that altogether, you've got a lot more efficient sort of a process. Um, so as I mentioned, we, we started a spin-out company, uh, MOF Technology. So just to mention that briefly, I'm, I'm, not, uh, 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 I'm not associated with MOF Technologies anymore. Those guys are doing an absolutely fabulous job of taking things on. And, um, uh, but, you know, essentially you can do this, you can make materials. Also, what's kind of interesting is that you can do um, synthesis and you can do processing in one go. So you can make pellets in one go. Yeah? And I think this is another theme for sy synthesis by extrusion going forward. Uh, it's not just synthesis, but there's also the potential to process into particular shapes. And this is just a quick look uh, at uh, some of the facilities that MOF Technologies has. So this is a larger extruder, basically sort of pilot plant scale, and this can uh, give you about 15 kilos per hour. Even in one of those small extruders where you have it in a fume, you can do about a kilo per hour. And I mentioned these space-time yields due to showing the efficiency of these things. Um, what does that actually mean tangibly? What it means to me is that as a chemist, if you try to think about how you were gonna make 10 kilograms of a product. And if you were gonna try and do that just in a standard fume cupboard, you would really struggle. Uh, if, you know, how on earth would you do that? The, the size of the glassware, the equipment that you'd need or the solvent that you'd need, uh, it would be really, really daunting to do that. In principle, if you can get twin screw extrusion to work, you can make 10 kilos of something in a day. Yeah, uh, with in principle, no waste. So again, I just do think that you know, extrusion has really got some, yeah, got some advantages. You can do organic synthesis as well. So this was the Novanagel reaction that went yellow, as I, as I showed before. But you know, since then, uh, we and others have showed all sorts of different types of chemical reactions. Not to go into the details of those, but to point out that these are the sort of building blocks or the, the connection, you know, connections that you need to make dyes, OLED materials, pharmaceuticals, yeah? Uh, and this can all 
I am convinced this can all be done. You know, pharmaceuticals can be made in, in, in this way. In fact, we've, we've shown that recently, though I'm not going to talk in detail about it. Um, you can make liquid products as well. So it's not just all about solids. You might think, why, why would you want to make liquids? And it's because they can be viscous and you know, they, can, they can crystallize and all the rest of it. So they can be problematic. You can do liquids. And again, we showed some advantages there because you're only heating them up briefly. In this case, uh, our uh, TSE product, the transfer extrusion product, shows less composition, de less decomposition than when you make these by the batch methods. So advantages there, you can one, run one reaction into another. So uh, you can uh, use the different zones of your barrel for doing different reactions. In this case, doing what, first reaction in the first three zones, then adding in another reagent and doing a second reaction there. So again, more efficiency because you don't have to isolate products all the time, just react them straight on. This is an example of that one where we, uh, so we actually made an organic product and then uh, reacted it with a metal. Um, incredibly efficient, really. Um, hard to argue with that. So interesting opportunities for extrusion. I think going forward, um, solid state catalysts, uh, we've made some of these uh, by, uh, by milling before. I think looking at that by extrusion and plus processing them into the right sorts of shapes. Zeolites are huge and important class of porous materials. Uh, that sort of thing needs to be developed by extrusion, I think. Of course, we've got all organics and metal organics, the dyes, the farmer, the agri. Also, layered materials, this is something that we're working on. How do you delaminate materials to, to change their properties? And, and this can actually be done as well. Nanoscale materials, what happens when you try to form, you know, uh, form these things under high shear conditions that you have in an extruder? So just some conclusions on that. I think mechanochemistry is absolutely fascinating area with a huge potential. Uh, what we need more of, I think, is the fundamental understanding. So kinetic models, I think, are one good way to go to start to place mechanochemistry on a firmer footing and make it perhaps more predictable. Um, so the kinetics can be surprisingly simple or they can be quite complex. And there we have this interplay of the mechanics and the chemistry. And mechanochemistry is scalable through extrusion methods and uh, can indeed be uh, commercialized. I should say that actually MOF technologies now make MOFs and they uh, mechanochemically and, and they sell them. So if I could just acknowledge a few people, um, Debbie Crawford, uh, I think has given a, a talk in this series already. Uh, she is really the sort of expert in the extrusion um, uh, in the group. She, she made that, that whole, you know, project and that technique her own and she's now independent at the University of Bradford. Uh, Amy Marr did the painstaking, painstaking kinetics in the first place and that was hard stuff to do. Ben Hutchings also followed that up with some kinetics work. I also like to credit Anne Pichon uh, just as a, uh, as a bit of a story. When I first bought a ball mill and brought it back to the lab everyone stared at this thing as if it was from another planet and said what on earth is this thing? I said it's a ball mill and they said what does it do? I said it grinds stuff up. And they say, why did you buy us this? And uh, how much was it? And I said, it was about 3,000 pounds. And, and they said, so what was wrong with buying a plasma TV? You know, And they had no idea what this ball mill was and what it was for, but Anne actually did, was the one that gave it a go for the first time and found out, yeah, you can make moths this way. Uh, collaborators who've been important over the years, uh, Tony McNally uh, in Warwick, uh, he's in Warwick now, and uh, it, we collaborated with him a lot on the extrusion and trying to understand that. Steve Bell on the kinetics, Pajan Hu with some uh, modelling of um, the thermal aspects of uh, some of these reactions. Uh, funding, uh, it's been not bad, you know, we, we've got funding from EPSRC, the Levy Hume Trust, um, currently Johnson Mathy and, and Solvay, um, and so you know, I, I do think, uh, you know, the funding opportunities are out there and industry is certainly waking up to the potential of, uh, of extrusion. So with that, I will stop and, uh, and ask if there might be any questions, more than happy to, uh, to try and answer them. Wonderful, thank you so much. We do have quite a few questions. I will pick a few of them for you. All right, let's start with this one. In the, in the kinetics, as a function of shaking rate, you ascribe the increase in reaction rate with shaking speed to number of collisions. Have you considered whether the force itself increases with shaking speed? Along the same lines, how do you anticipate force itself affects the kinetics? 
Okay, well, so a terrific question. Um, and, you know, I, I have to say, you know, we're, we're at the very earliest stages of these, and there will be things that we haven't thought of. And uh, um, I think it is quite possible. I think it's quite possible what you're saying, because I can imagine that with each collision, if it's a more violent collision, then effectively you may well get reaction down to a deeper depth between the particles. So I think it's quite possible as well. All right, thank you. Here's the next one. Uh, you mentioned at one point that the barrel was heated and this caused the water to evaporate. Could the temperature rise also be contributing to the reactions you observe? Yeah, for sure. So, so that's some, so that's something that we feed into uh, uh, into you know designing well, I suppose designing the process is perhaps too grand a word, but really try, trying to get chemical reactions to work. The temperature of the barrel is is a key consideration, um, and that in itself then brings in other complications. Uh, you know, and considerations uh, is that certain temperature needed to actually melt one of the reagents? Is it really mechanochemistry in the end if you're going through melt phases? Um, but certainly, you know, temperature is is fundamentally important in many of these reactions that we do. And it's almost, to be honest, sort of adventitious in the end, uh, in that case, that, you know, we were taking up to 150, I think, to get the reaction to go. We realized, well, an, an aspect of that is then you're losing the water off just as steam. So, yeah, temperature is important for getting reactions to go to. All right. Thank you. With regards to the Novonagel reactions, you mentioned that the rheology alters the reaction mechanics in the middle of the reaction time, and the gooey substance mm. appears to coat the walls and balls of the reactor. Is mm. there any evidence of reaction with the reactor materials that further, further catalyzes this step? In other words, if you change the reactor composition, can you alter the kinetics? Yeah, uh, I mean, doubtless, I mean, I, I probably, there are, there are a lot of people that have um, you know, working in this area, I may not be the best person to ask about this. We do tend to stick with steel. Um, but um, as, as a simple example, if you change from steel to Teflon, for example, then you're changing the, the weight, the momentum, therefore, of the ball. And so you, you can then expect the, uh, the kinetics to change. Um, you mentioned sort of catalytic effects. I, th I think this is going to be really interesting going forward. I mean, there are some there's some terrific work um, already out there. You know, James Mack, I think, would, may have been the first to start using copper vessels to get, you know, reactions to be catalyzed by by the actual material of the of the jar. Um, I think that, you know, um, teasing that out and learning to control that and changing the surface and actually designing the surfaces to be catalytically active is a huge opportunity, especially when it comes to extrusion. Because of course, you know, a catalyst, you want it to be able to catalyze the reaction, but you don't want it to end up in your product. So if you can get, you know, these extrusion processes to be um, catalytic in terms of the, you know, the, the material of the screws and the barrel, then yeah, that's great. I, I'm sure some of that does happen already. Uh, yeah, and, and some people have shown that already, but I think there's a lot to be developed. All right, great. Let's do just one more. I was curious about the chemical synthesis by extrusion method. Do you lose any yield due to either the react, re, reagent powders or product powder adhering to the screws inside the instrument along the grinding path? If there's a reaction, yeah. I'm sorry, I'll just finish sorry, no, up. Go ahead. <laughs> okay. If there's a reaction between reactants A and B, and reactant A cakes on the screws over time, does the amount of product produced per unit time decrease the longer it runs since you're unable to use some of one of the reactants? Yeah, yeah, I mean, absolutely it will, yeah. So, so this is something that, I mean, I don't think we've actually seen that specifically happen in any cases, but obviously if that was happening, then you're gonna have to rethink, you know, uh, you know how you're doing it and maybe you go to a higher temperature perhaps to get over those melting points or, or, or even just, you know, uh, changing the temperature to encourage wetting between your two reactants, that can be done as well. Um, the, um, you will lose material, especially if, you know, essentially we, we don't really run the extruders continuously. You know, we, we, we would do typically, it might be like a 25 gram batch in a sense. And it's really just to run it long enough that we can get continuous conditions and we can be sh certain that the reaction does go under particular conditions. But of course, um, what, you would, what you would expect is that ultimately, if these things are actually implemented industrially, then they will be running continuously. You know, so you're um, so in terms of like you know the 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 
the first part of the reaction where you might not have had you know, perfect conversion, you can basically forget about that. And also, you know, when by the time we finish an experiment, then the screws will be coated with the reactant and the product, and that's all got to be cleaned. And actually, that's a bit of a job quite often. But as I say, the idea is that ultimately you go to continuous process which might which might run for you know weeks or months you know without being stopped and so you don't have those things to worry about all right excellent thank you so much dr stewart for your presentation oh my pleasure thank you thanks for the invitation actually thank you again dr james for that outstanding presentation and thank you for joining us here at the mechanochemistry discussions Remember that all of our previous presentations are available and hosted on our YouTube channel. We encourage you to check them out. In addition, stay tuned for an excellent slate of upcoming speakers in the months ahead. Thank you.